The surface on Aberration is most certainly the most dangerous place to visit without the right know-how. One minute you can be exploring for those precious loot drops and in the blink of an eye find you and your prize tames roasting to ashes. But fear not, dear survivor, because we'll explain why it's worth venturing, what you need and how to explore without worrying about being burnt or running into a single reaper. So, the surface is comprised of your formulaic obelisks, red, green and blue, each representing an explorable area to access their terminals. Though why you'd want to remotely touch these terminals anymore is beyond me, having charge stations and safer loot crates providing much easier access to your downloading and uploading, but they're there. As well as the only spots for sky beacons you've come to know from previous maps. However, each location are riddled and infested with seekers nameless, aberrant for solars and surface reaper kings. The latter two you'll want to pay extra interest to being that one is a much more easier tame than its scorched earth counterpart owed to metal, obsidian and element or rich rocks in absolute abundance and the second because you'll not only need to be incredibly quick on your feet if you plan on farming drops but likely once ready be prepared to run through all with a fine tooth comb until you find the tribute rewarding but overwhelmingly frightening alpha variant. But whoa there! sparky because there's a much bigger force to fear than the broken arcs inhabitants and that's the environment on predetermined in-game days as night passes to day at alternating times the sun will raise literal hell scorching the entire surface with an impending flame melting everything in its wake which yes means including you Fortunately, Aberration's gravitational rotation operates on a regular cycle, with you needing to know two simple rules. One, there's three cycles. ASE players take note especially expecting the same deal, as ASA app works very differently, offering a change in how much day and how much night is offered per in-game day. Rotating from 50% day and 50% night to 90% day and 10% night and through to 10% day and 90% night, the latter of which you'll be aiming for for your surface runs with each of the three fixed cycles changing at the stroke of midnight to the next cycle, with 50% day and night running for four days on every 10th, 1st, 2nd and 3rd day, 90% day running for three days on every 4th, 5th and 6th day, and 90% night running for three days on every 7th, 8th and 9th day. And two, it's based on day and environment, not Time. Older players for the original game will explore night cycles expecting it to change today at exactly 5.30am and whilst it's almost true for 50% day, the cycle operates very, very differently for ASA Aberration. First, you need to understand that solar waves operate just like real life, with the sun rising on one end of aberration and slowly sweeping across the rest of the map, meaning the green and blue obelisks or northeast and northwest surfaces will begin to burn first, with the fiery tidal wave finally reaching red obelisk or southwest surface anywhere between 15 minutes and 1 hour 52 minutes later. Fortunately, every night cycle starts at the same time, with 50% starting at 18.51pm, 90% day starting at 23.08pm and 90% night starting at 14.16pm. Daytime, however, works very differently. <sighs> The northwest surface areas begin 50% day at 06.51 a.m. and reaches the southwest surface at 08.01 a.m. 90% day north starts at 02.27 a.m. and reaches south at 04.19 a.m. And 90% night north starts at 11.08 a.m. and reaches south at 11.23 a.m. Yes. <laughs> Meaning, if it wasn't obvious enough, the Red Ob South surface area provides the most time available to explore during a 90% night cycle. Each surface is accessed via a semi-secluded access corridor, with one for the northwest blue surface and you'll need to prepare for spores with either agaravic mushrooms or hazard gear, with the northeast and the southwest surfaces offering two entrances. 
the latter conveniently situated right by the portal spawn, but the other leading from the red radiation zone. So take warning if you get your entrances confused and end up traveling down the wrong one. Reversed, all entrances apart from blue can be geolocated from the surface easily due to the giant metal hangar-like structures built once ago, but it's always worth acquainting yourself at intervals during your first surface travels to not be left panicking trying to find a way out before being burnt to a crisp. All surface entrances are inaccessible via on-foot travel, and nor would you really want to, with the flagship mount suggestion being a rock drake for the best mobility once there. Though there's some argument to prove Cosmo travelling is maybe even better, and perhaps a high weight Yi Ling if you're feeling a bit daring. But whichever time you choose to access, make sure it's something that allows you to travel high and in the air. As mentioned before, the floor is quite literally Zen morph lava with dozens of reapers in condensed spaces all over quickly spelling your demise should you travel on land unprepared but should you plan to go prepared a light charge pet is an absolute necessity to debuff reapers or at the very least to keep nameless at bay as you access drops the former by the way shouldn't be confused with reaper queens being much stronger variants and the only means of giving birth to your own mini ripley on top of some form of charged light, a glider suit shouldn't go amiss in the possibility of a means of escape, but you'll want to bound it to the best armour you can wear should a reaper clip you when running to mount your rock drake. And by this point, you're probably thinking, why bother venturing to the surface at all, right? Well, there's plenty of reasons you'll want to, with the first most obvious one being drops. Despite underground loot drops working on their own rotations and now offering double drops, with yellow and red being incredibly rewarding at times, and artifact cave drops most notably offering high-tiered gear worth waiting on and repeatedly running, surface drops are not only bountiful themselves, offering a majority of aberration exclusive items up to ascendant quality including the highly desired drake saddle bp but much quicker to access being in one contained space a rock drake is perhaps the best choice to keep navigating between each drop and at least on the south surface can find a steady rhythm of bouncing between the three spawning drops to continue to farm that precious loot the other two surface areas sadly only offer one or two at a time, something that's really always bugged me, giving even more reason to drop hunt around Red Obelisk on top of the extended travel time. With each drop despite the colour, it's worth grabbing every drop to at least allow a new one to spawn, and possible to at speed dismounting a rock drake, but in ASA, reapers will come gunning straight away without an intimidation roar, so make sure to practice when to land and when to land for each drop. Loot you can expect to find up to Ascendant Hazard gear, standard weapons and gear, climbing picks, saddles for all aberration creatures and even a wealth of late game structures from both vanilla and DLC engrams. Bay Plays Games has a full extensive guide on what loot to expect and I'll leave a link for that vid in the description. Reason 2 is resources. There's a lot, like a lot Metal is in abundance everywhere and in fact can be in rich qualities in the northwest surface entrance, but oil, obsidian, crystal and most importantly element ore. Whilst all of these resources can be found underground on the surface can be found all over the gaff. Your only problem is having the weight to carry it and well reapers. But reason three is charge nodes. Despite them being everywhere now allowing terminal access in Arc Ascended, their primary purpose is to refill charge batteries or craft elements. Charge batteries which can be used to power many electrical devices such as turrets without the need of a generator can gain a full battery life in about 158 seconds in an underground station, allowing up to 10 batteries to be charged at once before the station needs powering back up again after 2 minutes. Surface charge stations, however, take only 50 seconds to refill the same amount of batteries with the same cooldown, but it's crafting element where the real difference comes into play. Requiring 8 charged batteries, 10 red gems, 15 blue gems, 20 green gems, 20 element ore, and 50 gas balls will allow you to craft 3 element at once, taking 
about 25 seconds to craft, but upon crafting, will shut down the station altogether, needing an additional 40 minutes after that to craft more elements on the surface, but a whopping two hours on underground charge stations. Not forgetting you have to manually press the craft button each time, it's fair to feel how brutally tedious it can be if crafting anywhere but surface terminals for a decent amount of element. But either way, you'll want to prepare to use every single one at once to amount anything substantial. And reason four is for solas. Just go and try and tame one now and comment below how easy you found it. But hang on, Ross Clark, Reapers, bro. Ah, well, with the new day cycles now, whether it was a bug or intended, despite the knights changing to a new measure for ASA, Reapers and Nameless seem to be stuck clinging onto their evolved memories, as they'll only pop out of the ground between the hours of 5.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m., meaning on a 90% night cycle, you've got more than enough time to knock out even a couple of Fasolos. Just make sure to be well away and out of Rendo if they're not ready to eat and tame before the next night cycle. And that's your lot. If there's something I missed, drop a comment below. But until the next one, my name is Ross Clark. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And as always, uh, peace out. Uh.